Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second keynote speech uh, of the Jout Call 2022 conference. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Dehan. Uh, Jonathan Dehan is a, an associate professor in the Faculty of International Relations at the University of Shizuoka. So he's our local Japan-based, uh, game-based learning researcher. Uh, he's been researching and teaching language and literacy skills with games for over 20 years. He's currently exploring the boundaries of teaching language and literacy with and around games with his ongoing project, The Game Terra Coya. Jonathan also edits the journal Ludic Language Pedagogy with me, and we'll be talking about that more on Sunday. Uh, Jonathan has been hugely inspirational in my own professional development. Uh, I learned about his work around 2012, so 10 years ago, when I was a, a fresh-faced university teacher considering what my research agenda should look like. Uh, as I had some great experiences learning uh, Japanese with various games, and being a gamer myself, I decided to explore the link between games and language learning and teaching. At that time, the only person, or the person that stood out, I should say, as doing innovative things with games in, in, in language teaching context was Jonathan. Um, from then, it was around eight years ago, so around 2014, that I met Jonathan in person at a symposium in Kyoto. Uh, since then, we've worked together professionally on a number of projects, always metaphorically poking at each other's work in a way to push ourselves to be better teachers and researchers. He's my senpai in many areas, though he's reluctant to admit it, uh, as a gamer, a researcher, a thinker, and a teacher. Uh, today, however, in a rare case of distance between us, uh, Jonathan has been secretly working on the content of this talk without the, <laughs> without the input of me or the other members of the LLP community, which both excites me and scares me. <laughs> Expect the unexpected, think big, be open and enjoy as Jonathan talks about games and play in researching language teaching and learning, answering the question, what really matters? Jonathan, I hand the mic over to you. Hey, thank you for that lovely introduction, James. Uh, I hope I live up to everything that you just said. Um, yeah, as I've got a, a slide of a raccoon drowning in the ocean, right? Um, yeah, it's all down here, downhill from here, right? So uh, thank you. So. Uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Um, I really want to thank James York and Fred Poole for putting together a conference on all of these wonderful themes. I especially want to applaud them for explicitly pushing the field to move from theory and research from potential to efforts that make a difference for students, schools, and society to practice. Because I think I did something is a lot better. It's more inspirational. It's more constructive. It's more practical than X might be possible to be done. Because spoiler, I think that that's the persistent refrain of digital game-based language learning, DGBLL, potential. And I'd like to try to counter that a little bit in this talk. I'm so sick of the word potential and its connection to games and language learning. If we were all in a shared physical location, I'd propose that anyone who uses the word potential at this conference get beaten with something. For nearly 40 years, this has been the position of researchers and academics in games and language learning, right? Taking the off ramp. You might think I'm being too critical, that lab research is important, that lab research and academic papers somehow do trickle out to society somehow. Okay, how about this? Change DGBLL researchers to cancer researchers. We dismiss or discredit, at the very least, cancer researchers who, after 40 years, never produced anything or even tried to produce anything that got us any closer to helping citizens or society. And I think that we should hold games and language researchers to a similar standard. They, we, I, we need to use our positions, power, knowledge, resources, connections, and yes, research, theory, and practice to make a real difference for students and society. If DGBLL can't actually do that, then we should give up and do something else like tutor sick kids or clean a river or something like, like right now. If we can't make a difference in real classrooms, we've created another academic silo, an echo chamber, an academic game for its own sake, not for the sake of students and other teachers. And it's really not a game and language problem either, right? You can see uh, all these things about social impact games, games for change. The games for change, the educational games, the serious games movement has also struggled to have impact. Look at the words there, right? Narrowly, politicized, inflexible, confusing, not connected. Impact? And what does impact even mean? What, what is impact? Short-term learning outcomes? 
or changing the world. Uh, Paolo Pedrocini argued a radical, powerful idea that to have impact, you need to work to make yourself obsolete. So this talk is going to be about me trying to make myself a little bit more obsolete, giving other people, giving you some power to try to change the field. Me being obsolete means that I really make a difference to students in society and that you really make a difference to students in society too. Me being obsolete might mean that you design an amazing game with massive support and a great community. Maybe you make a beautiful print and play game or a role play instead of a digital app, or you do some awesome research or awesome, awesome teaching, or you teach others to make things, do research, teach better in their contexts to make their lives better. Those would all contribute to me becoming more obsolete. If you don't get anything else out of my talk, know that there is a community that is active and eager to help you, Ludic Language Pedagogy. I'm the co-editor, I'm pretty active in the Discord. LLP is a shortcut, a cheat code, a guild, a strategy guide. You can publish all kinds of things there. You can talk to other people, you can level up, you can hack academia. Let's play. My talk is about what matters in games, in ludic language pedagogy. So what does mattering mean? All right, okay, by dictionary definition, to be important or significant. It's pretty simple, easy enough, right? So what's important? What's significant? So what matters? I'm honestly all over the map on the answer to that question of what matters. I've at time thought that everything matters, which of course it does. Everything has value, everything connects to everything. Students, teachers, researchers, websites, social media, government, local situations, everything matters equally. And if everything matters, then everything can and needs to be thought about and influenced. But of course, that can lead a person to nervous breakdowns and burnout, speaking from experience. Or on the other hand, I've at times thought that nothing matters, which of course is also true. Jalt call, games, me, you, the earth, our schools, our students, everything we see, do, say, or try is a tiny blip that cannot influence the entirety of the universe in any meaningful way. And so we should just give up, like right now. But of course that can turn a person into a cynical, bitter, pokey jerk, also speaking from experience. So we can, or we should, choose to make something matter. I've decided for this talk, for my work, that you matter, your students matter. Good teaching matters to your students. Good research matters if it connects to good teaching. Two notes before I start. Um, you can get all the, sl the slides and the things that I talk about from my website. And I think James is gonna post those links in the, uh, the, the chat. So you can either follow along, grab the slides or read things afterwards. And again, like we can definitely keep talking about contradictions and advice and mattering and you, your sense making more after the talk, not just in the Q&A, but in the LLP Discord, right? Which is which James is gonna share. Okay, so buckle up, I've only got an hour. I'm gonna be using some themes and concepts throughout my story and my talk. These themes will connect to my perspective on what really matters in games and play in researching and teaching language. Here's my shipment 51. Sustainability, hype cycles, integration, praxis, mediation, empty babble, normalization, transformation. Uh, I had to cheat a little bit, literacy and impact. It was reviewed pretty well in 110% for Gamers Magazine. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly brush through those before I get to story time. So sustainability, right? The, the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. Are we actually using new and old technologies in wise ways? Are we creating and maintaining sustainable teaching and research standards, as well as relationships with students and each other? Are we balancing work, home, health, and society in our lives and our work? Hype cycles. I'm just gonna ask a bunch of questions. Um, definition, right? So here's a hype cycle. My daughter drew this. It's a graphical and conceptual presentation of the maturity of emerging technologies through five fa phases. There's a technology trigger, inflated expectations. I'm gonna make a lot of money off of this. When it doesn't work, there's disillusionment. And then when you start thinking, there's enlightenment and productivity. That's usually where the teaching comes in. Um, in Jolt Call, in LLP, there's, there are numerous tech triggers. There's also plenty of tech disillusionment. 
Um, recently, I looked at all the well-cited game-based language learning articles, and I rarely saw teaching actions mentioned or discussed. There, you can look at that paper later, right? People who are purporting to do game-based language teaching aren't reporting teaching. You know, what does that do to a hype cycle? Um, Frederick Corneli, Steve Thornton, and uh, I think it's Paul, right? Desmet, right? They did this the scoping review and showed less and less interest in teaching, uh, more interest in experimental research or theory or design. What does this have on all of our expectations and disillusionment? For mattering, does tech even matter? Can we distance ourselves and our students from the tech a little bit to ask about things that other that other things that matter? Integration. The combination of te technology and teaching, right? We can look at substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition, right? Look at the bottom, right? Tech acts as a direct tool substitute. This is what we're doing most of the time, substituting different games or different tech, but not changing how we teach. At the top, tech allows for the creation of new tasks, previously inconceivable, right? Can games actually give us a way to create new ways of teaching and learning? I, I think they can, and I'll share my approach later. I think the field is stuck at the bottom. Right? It's really about thinking differently about both pedagogy and content, content that moves us out of the bottom in any way that matters. Jeff Kuhn recently published this lovely article. Um, it's in the talk notes on my website on the history of DGBLL and the failure to integrate games into teaching. He argues for a backwards design approach to integration. Look at number one, think about the goal first. Don't start with the technology first, but rather start with the goal of education and then think about how first pedagogy and then games can be used to reach those goals. I think this nicely sums up the majority of goals for writers, academics, and researchers on games in language learning. Blinders on, vocab from hell to breakfast. Does vocabulary matter? Does an overfocus on vocabulary matter? Does focusing on vocabulary instead of other goals make sense? What other goals should we be thinking about? And of course, we can talk more about backwards design, exploratory pedagogy, and reflexive pedagogy if you want. If the purpose of education is to develop students' interests and abilities to participate as they wish in various private, public, and professional areas of life, then games, if used at all, should directly facilitate students reaching this goal. Praxis. John Reinhardt has a nice definition in his, his book on games. An integrated approach to engaging theory with research and teaching practices, a dialogic back and forth between action and reflection grounded in reasoning and experience. Praxis is sort of my little ranty hill to die on. I really see research and practice diverging. Researchers are doing short-term small group experimental studies or large-scale surveys. Teachers are perpetuating weak forms of language and communication. Teachers don't access or can't use research, and research doesn't consider teachers. The best ways to get published don't make a difference in the classroom. I'm sick of paywalled articles with mullings of potential and throw away implications for practice. There's a huge need for projects that have praxis baked in. Classroom-based teaching, drawing on theory and research that makes a difference for teachers and students and society. Can we work together to design run and publish game-based praxis-driven call. M is not for motivation, right? Uh, shipment, M is not for motivation. There are way too many game-related projects just focused on motivation. Um, Judith crafted one of my favorite quotes in the game literature. We need more than motivation for entertainment. We need to foster motivation to learn in order to prepare learners for experiencing the world in richer ways that will prepare them for future learning, right? It's a beautiful question, beautiful uh, words from Judith. Of course, motivation is important, but the field needs to move beyond asking, do students like games? To, how, or to questions like, how can teachers help students meaningfully apply their motivations for many things in meaningful work inside and outside the classroom? Is this what education's about? What games in education are about? Rewards or punishments, which are pretty much the same thing? Are rewards and punishments all that games can do? I really don't think so. Let's drop the stick, drop the carrot, and bring some meaning to the field. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to do meaningful things and more things that matter. I'm fine with that. I have been fine with that for a long time, and I think that you should be too. 
Um, and for those of you interested in gamific gamification, James just published a wonderful paper in Digital Culture and Education, right? How is gamification like being trapped in the matrix? And what is the real world of game-based learning? Um, it's, it's on my website, read it, share it, and please try to red pill others. Um, there's a link on, on the site. M is not for motiva motivation, M is for mediation. The interactions that teachers have with students before, during and after gameplay and other activities. We explain, we model, we frame, we guide, we question, we prompt, we give feedback. Yeah, of course, teachers and researchers can choose games and make worksheets, but they can, and this is rarely shown in the research literature, also interact with students during, before and after gameplay. Right. Uh, James and I published a paper on lo looking at teaching with games uh, as, as a delicious MMM, mm, right? The methods, whether you use CLT, TBLT, PetML, whatever, materials, worksheets, and mediation, things that teachers do. Both games and teachers are interactive. I, I don't think people realize this yet. Digital games can provide feedback to learners, but teachers are still the ultimate interactive technology. They help students take successful gameplay experiences into discussions and into further learning and doing. There are not enough projects that research, um, research projects that investigate or detail what teachers do and say before, during, and after gameplay. It's a huge missed opportunity, a gold mine for teachers and researchers to make themselves make a name for themselves in the field. Can we stop describing games so much? Can we describe teaching a bit more, please? Empty babble, talk for its own sake. Uh, take a look at Penny Cook. I mean, I, I know some people argue, argue with me about this. Like, I know that some people and some students enjoy and find meaning in just talking or just using the language in the CLT classroom. But what does that just talking result in? Fluency, sharing, a little bit of practice, fine. But what other goals should we set? What kind of communication inside and outside the, the classroom should we be striving for? And what kind of classes and teacher actions will get students doing that? We don't have to stamp out all the empty babble. It's our jobs as teachers and researchers to mediate game-based learning, to add to and go beyond empty babble, which can be done by thinking about what the ultimate goals for our classrooms and research projects are. Much of the literature on teaching language with games is missing an ideological backbone, ignoring fundamental purposes and processes of education. And again, if the purpose of education is to develop students' interests and abilities to participate as they wish in these different areas of life, then games, if used at all, should directly facilitate students reaching this goal. Once you start to ask, why am I using games in the classroom or anything, of course, right, in the lab, you'll probably find that there will be less empty babble and instead discussions and conversations that are focused, humane, purpose-driven, and probably even more enjoyable to the boot. Why are we using games in teaching and research? What do games really add to our teaching and learning? Do games matter? What good are they? Games, so what? If you dare ask your students, so what? Playfully, I do all the time. Ask yourself as a teacher or a researcher about your own work, so what? Why does this matter? Please keep asking me, so what? Normalization. The state in which the technology is so embedded in our practice that it ceases to be regarded as either a miracle cure-all or something to be feared. Games, a miracle cure-all? Games, something to be feared? Still pretty popular opinions, I think. Thinking only about technology keeps technology from being normalized. To consider how, to, to, to normalize a technology is to consider how it will be used, in what context and for what kind of learning. Normalization work makes sure that expert intervention is connected to technology use, teachers scaffolding, modeling, and challenging in order to bring about better learning. Doing this would mean moving from one-off experimental studies in labs to sort of an action research model of creating, trying, reflecting on, and continuing interventions with learners and technologies in classes. What pedagogy, what research would treat games like we treat pencils? It's worth a long discussion and lots of great scholarship together. Transformation, right? To increase students' mastery of key course concepts while transforming their learning-related attitudes, values, beliefs, and skills. I like that transformation includes skills in coursework, 
but also other holistic, human, interpersonal aspects. Um, definitely check out the Human Restoration Project. They're, they're sort of the one-stop shop for bringing more humanity into education. Um, for JALT, call for LLP, I'm really concerned that neoliberal education narrows the range of human potential and also the range of teaching and research that we do. To see change, we only focus on what we know we can change, some vocabulary increases or a bit of speaking fluency. To make call or LLP matter more, how about this? A, let's get to know our students more. Ask them, who are you? Then B, ask them, who do you want to be? Let's collaboratively set some broader, more lofty, more humane, more transformative learning goals. And then C, let's figure out how to get them from A to B. Teachers lead development. Teachers can lead students' radical and humane transformations. To understand who our students are and who they want to be before we can hope to help them transform towards their goals, we have to ask them. You have to mediate. Ask your students, who are you and who do you want to be? It's the best thing you can do for your teaching and research. Um, here are some of my students' self-ethnographic representations of their two-month to two-year transformative journeys from who they were to who they became with my help and with other students' help. I'll talk more about them later. But this is what's possible with games and education. Can we transform our teaching and research to be more transformative? Literacy. Uh, yeah, sure. The ability to read and write. No problem, but no. I think we can expand that to include experiences, all kinds of media, not just printed text, and to understand those experiences deeply and to connect understandings to society and culture, and then to participate using text, media, and other things in society, right? There's a huge untapped potential in call and teaching with games. We can matter more by thinking about deeper and broader literacies, right? We can think about language and literacy, other genres, right? Reviews, tweets, emails, streams, these are all important. Other contexts, not just school, but personal, public, professional, hobby, online, and better school as well. Other audiences, society, power, um, technologies, and meanings. We can think more about students' game literacies. Game literacy is about playing, understanding, and making games, and, and using games to participate in society. And of course, teachers' pedagogical literacy as well, right? Being exposed to studying and applying different methods, right? We need to know about things like connected learning, project-based learning, edupunk, pedml, media literacy education. Um, finally, impact, before I start to tell some stories. Um, Paolo Perugini explores impact in that talk I mentioned earlier. It's one of the best talks ever given on games and learning and research. Um, I, I watch it a couple times a year just to stay on track. Um, he discusses impacts, complexities, and difficulties and conditioning or possibly even brainwashing involved in truly measuring the effect one thing has on another. He also critiques sustainability. We researchers get funding, we make a game, we test it with a few students or a few thousand students, the funding dries up and the game becomes abandoned where? What impact does that model have for students in society? Is there any? We shouldn't be chasing easy but non-impactful changes. Narrow vocabulary increase, gamified motivation spikes, or likes or shares on social media. We need to consider long-term sustainable impact, which means that we need to think about smaller, more meaningful, maybe more grassroots projects that are designed to be continued. Even if we do that, I think we'll still struggle to measure impact. So Paolo offers a radical reframing and a solution to this that's been a good mantra for me. Make ourselves obsolete. Empower people to make games or anything to enact the change they want, not the ones that we want. You know what to do. Don't hand out fishes. Teach people to fish for themselves. To have real impact, empower learners. Help them make, research, communicate, and thrive in their own self-determined ways. Can we make ourselves obsolete? That's honestly how we might have the most impact. OK, there it is. That's my shipment 51. I'm gonna call back to those themes throughout the remainder of my talk and in my career too. Okay, moving on to the next section. Hopefully everybody's uh, along for the ride. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna tell some stories about what I have done 
I crafted this talk based on conversations I've had with James and Fred and many people over the years. Um, James and Fred thought that me telling my story of teaching and researching games and language education for more than 20 years would be helpful to newer people in the field. I'm going to try to highlight various concrete next steps for research and teaching with games. And I'm going to try to steer you away from pitfalls and dead ends that I ran into at full speed. I hope that you've got a nice beverage or a snack. Put your feet up. It's story time. So I'll call the first stage turning a hobby into part of a job. I hope you gamers like this part. Um, I like games. I play, I've always played a lot of different games, video games, PC, board uh, games, card games, RPGs, commercial games, educational games, playground, indie, folk games, D&D, sports, choose your own adventure book, books, weird art experiments, whatever. I'm like a forager, a collector. I just want to play everything. I love finding new, new games, not just video games, any kind of game. Which And my playing games led to other activities, reading books about games, the history, the technology, the culture, the theory, the design. I started making games, board games, computer games, crappy educational games, make-believe games with my kids, running RPGs for my kids in my car, listening to YouTube, um, right, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube. There are thousands of hours of education up there. Dice Tower, Giant Bombcast, Game Design Roundtable, One Up Yours, Ludology, Video Game Apocalypse, GDC, E3, PAX, Games for Change. It's all out there for free to educate ourselves. And then watching people play games too. I ran winning 11 tournaments for students, Smash Brothers tournaments, and watching YouTube and, and Twitch streams. This helped. I gained a ton of literacy, right? That lit literacy stuff again, playing, understanding, and making. I found myself loving learning about the domains and questions that David Buckingham, a media literacy education scholar, suggests that students explore and answer to understand games and media deeply, right? Production language, representation, and audience. And that helped because my curiosity and experiences led to other things, using all kinds of games and play in my teaching. So games at Akaiwas, uh, communicative language teaching games, teaching a bit of drama, using uh, doing uh, model United Nations with students. I did some game design work and research work in my MAT SOL. My first research publications and conference publications, or oh, conference presentations were on games. I wanted to do a PhD to answer some big questions about games. And then I was offered, offered jobs with freedom to play a bit, right? And then future developments, starting LLP with James, teaching for, you know, working with other people to teach in TESOL, and even high school collaborations now with games. Okay, so does playing games matter? So what? Well, keep that broader literacy concept in mind, right? That idea of playing, understanding, and participating in society. Sustainability, for sure. Right? Our own curiosity can motivate us and keep us enthusiastic about what we're doing. But there's a problem because if we're just focused on the games, we end up chasing new games. We're looking for that one game that can do everything that we want to do, which doesn't exist. Right? Um, it's, it's, we won't integrate if we just continue to substitute the latest hotness in games. But if you stick with your hobby long enough, right, getting some critical distance, you might actually accomplish this. Uh, Praxis, I don't know. Uh, we can talk about it later. Mediation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know how games work and I know how to talk about, about games with other students. And you can too with that critical distance. Uh, not sure if it fixes empty babble. Um, yep, normal, normalizing things, right? Getting that critical distance. Transformation, not sure yet. But literacy, for sure. You can help students play understand and make things with and without games. And you can find new research questions or no, new avenues for teaching. Impact, not sure yet. Okay, so it's sort of a mixed bag, right? Um, having, being a gamer, knowing about games, I think it all depends on if you can get that critical distance from games, just like anything, right? Because, so what matters, right? So in terms of teaching, it's good to, to know about games because knowing games helps you teach with games, just like knowing any other field helps you teach that field, right? It gives you ideas of things to do with students. It's sort of bad though, because it, this can sort of pull you away from others sort of middle of the road expectations regarding teaching a language, right? Like four skills, academic looking stuff. Knowing too much about games and not enough about teaching can be dangerous, right? You've got to have that, that balance. For research, can be good, 
right? Having game literacy helps you research new areas, looking at fan fiction or participatory trends, social media trends. It helps you find questions no one's answered yet. And you can also see the theory behind things that are happening. But it's dangerous because you can become too niche. You might be researching indie gm list storytelling role-playing games when the field still hasn't figured out what to do with Monopoly or Minecraft yet. You? Yeah, be a geek. Geek, geek is a good word, right? I'm using it in a, in, a, in a positive light. Enjoy what you do, right? Whether it's games or teaching or research, then be critical, have some distance, see other people's views. So in order to, to get that critical distance, keep notes, keep a diary, um, try lots of things. I, I have a channel on the LLP Discord called what Jonathan hates his video games hobby. And I blog and I think out loud and articulate the things that I love and hate about games. Reflect as you'd ask students to think, blog, diary, discord, talk to other people. For the field, playing games can be good. It can bring us together. We should have a monthly game group to play and talk and talk, right? Because I think that we are, or we could get stuck just playing games. I think we need to step back. We, we can play games, but we need to talk and step back and talk and step back to get us over that hype cycle. Okay. So that was step one. Next step of my journey using games, experiments and case studies. These don't matter much. Some of the earliest research I did with games to, was to understand the effects of interactivity on SLA. I ran two studies, one with a music game, one with a collection of mini games in which students of paired proficiencies either played or watched. Both groups were asked to recall vocabulary from the game that they had played or watched. In both of these studies, watchers, not players, watchers recalled more language than players, both on immediate and delayed post-tests. Players were immersed, they liked it, but the gameplay prevented them from noticing and remembering language, right? It can get in the way of students actually learning anything. After that, my lab worked with some high school students for a few months. The high school students chose a game from the lab, they took it home, they played it a few times a week, they completed game diaries, we gave them vocab and grammar pre and post tests, and we also watched them while they were playing. Here you go, here's the raw scores, right? <laughs> yeah, they're pathetic. As you can see, the students learned some vocabulary from the games, but did not improve, improve their grammar abilities, right? Just look at this, right? Like a month of playing games and someone learned two vocabulary words, right? We should have just given them some flashcards. So what? Yeah, students can learn language from games and some games are better than others, but students shouldn't just play games without taking notes and talking to others and teachers make sure that this happens. Sustainability, experiments and case studies are crazy sustainable, right? There are always new games to test. There's always new students come, coming in. They're pretty easy to do, but it's all about hype, right? Continued experiments don't, doesn't help anybody move through the, through the cycle or towards normalized practice. Integration, absolutely not, right? Uh, Zhao crit uh, crit critiques the field of, of, of games and language teaching with statements such as laboratory SLA research is particularly evident. This supports game design, not classroom instruction. And all this stuff makes it hard for teachers to adopt or implement it in a real language curriculum. Praxis, nope. Research doesn't speak to teachers. Mediation, nope. Lab experiments discourage all those messy interactions we like to call teaching, right? Empty babble, I think it's just research for its own sake. I think they're researchers just talking to other researchers. Normalization, nope, impossible. Transformation, uh, maybe, right? Uh, because even despite all that I just said, I would love to work with someone on a really cleverly designed experiment, connecting games, literacy playing, understanding, making, mediation, that could really change the whole field. It's sort of a moonshot, but it's something I'm thinking about. So if you've got an idea, let me know. Impact? No, I, I think typical experiments prevents impact from happening, but some sort of games and pedagogy experiment, maybe. On the whole, I think that experiments and case studies don't matter much. Sorry, Joel Cole. Um, teaching. These experiments often include discourse analysis. Like if you've got to give a students a test based on a game, the researcher has to play the game and they make a list of words that they're going to test. Those, those list of words can be useful for teachers, right? When they're included or accessible and not locked behind a paywall. 
experimental studies limit variables. They limit note-taking and mediation, and the results are rarely useful for teachers. Um, they are not practical for teachers who have to consider context, their students, and other language goals. Research. You can publish a lot on this on, on experiments and case studies. It's a great way to get started as long as you stop at some point, right? It's the best way to get published, tenure, and get noticed. But it's created this vaporware trend, right? This trend away from teaching. The, the field right now is hypothetical at best. You, SLA and call and education research lacks replication work, right? Um, think about a medical experiment where somebody finds something and they need to test it in another context. We don't do this in education enough, right? So to repeat an experiment, right? You can do a replication of an experimental study, right? Read the, read the experiment carefully, replicate it in your context, uh, publish your findings, talk, talk back to the, the, the researcher a little bit, either supporting or wh whatever, but then move on, right? And then if possible, don't just focus on digital games. Try a board game or poetry writing or storytelling. Experiment on some different types of games or play. For us, there are some really talented researchers in call. It would be awesome if these researchers would turn their skills towards designing pedagogy-focused experiments on different types of mediation or materials. We're in a pit of experiments and case studies. Do we want to get out? OK. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to speed through the next two sections because I want to get to some bigger issues at the end of the talk. Um, I'd be happy to talk about these next two with anyone at another time. And they are really deserving of more critical discussion and implementation in more contexts. First, part three, experiments and projects, or learn to never work harder than your students. I've done a lot of projects with students. I've made games, run charity events, public events, game groups, playtesting, volunteering. I wanted to create things. I wanted to connect students with society more. I wanted to prepare them for other academic success, life success, and career success. And projects can do these things. But just a quick reflection, um, all the projects that I've run with students have succeeded. Like based on them, students have gotten great internships, study abroad opportunities, great jobs. But these projects are sort of empty babble as well, right? Students practice, I, I, I found myself realizing that students were practicing what they already knew how to do. They didn't develop just by doing a project. So in this way, projects can be seen as a different type of test. Um, in terms of effort, you, these doing too much can lead to complete utter exhaustion. Um, I was running project work in my lab for four years with like 40 students extracurricularly on top of other teaching research and committee work. I, I was falling apart on a molecular level um, at the end of it. But I gained a lot of participatory literacy. I, I learned about so many different project ideas and different things to do with students. Um, this is a slide of what participatory projects my students have done over the past decade. It's, it's a Google slide that you can access from my website and you can dive into each of these. Each of these are hyperlinked to the actual project that you can see. Um, I show this to students because it's connected to roles in society, the different products, it's, it's the level of difficulty. I show this to inspire students, right? This is what your seniors have done. You could do something like this too and make it even better. Just some close-ups, right? All these different things, the events and games and books and reviews and all kinds of stuff. I suggest different roles and identities that students play. Are you like that? Who are you and who do you want to become? Are you a teacher? Are you um, a supporter? Are you a civil activist? Right? And I, and I sort projects based on those roles. So what? I've prepared answers to that question and we can talk, talk about that later if you like, but let me move on. Uh, and part four, analysis work, or students can actually use their brains if you teach them to or allow them to. So you remember that I said earlier that students who played games didn't remember language very well, right? So after all those projects and after I learned a little bit about functional linguistics, I developed a worksheet that had students do deeper functional analyses of a particular word or expression they noticed in a game. These explicit analyses helped students better understand, remember, and actually use new language from games in subsequent conversations and tasks. I didn't collect much data on this, and it's mostly anecdotal stuff, but I absolutely saw a small but meaningful difference in students. They were super engaged with what they were doing. They were using their brains. They were curious about how language worked in games. 
And there were some really lovely examples of students using language from games to communicate with me and others. Um, yeah, uh, the carefully crafted worksheet, so materials and my support, mediation, helped all the students dive into the work in a really neat way. Couple other examples, uh, again, literacy. I worked with a group of students to analyze the language in written game reviews. So we looked at the, the vocabulary, the style, the organization in review magazines, and then we took time to understand it. And then they phenomenally applied it in their own online game magazine about Japanese games that they loved and wanted to use English to introduce them to people in other countries. Experience, analyze, participate. I also worked with students for a week. Um, we did the same thing again, analyzing games, game advertisements, and game industry interviews. Then they created, the, we took time to analyze it, and then they created their own online game, a print advertisement, and gave a presentation, right? They incorporated, they appropriated all those various elements into their design work, and they improved in terms of vocabulary, grammar, speaking, and writing skills. Analysis took, took time. It really takes time, but students learned a lot, evidenced by them using it in their own work. Again, like it succeeds, right? Uh, if students analyze language, they can use it in their own work. Of course, there's a novelty effect, right? Learning, but but learning new, learning how to do new things is good. It just has to be continued. So students can actually use their brains if you allow them to, or encourage them to, if you ask better questions. I learned a lot about materials design. I learned to ask good questions that connects to good goals. Again, understanding an application my literacy about literacy leveled up. So ask better questions. Games don't need hype. They can be treated as an academic subject that requires purposeful exploration, guided contemplation, contextual analysis, and research and participatory work. Ask better questions. So what? Um, we can talk more about that later if you like. I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, all right, so in the next part of the story, I'm gonna slow back down a bit, uh, maybe hit a bit of an off-ramp in more than a few ways. So uh, <laughs> so for a while, I totally burned out, um, but I did rebuild. Um, and I have a longer version of this section and I have a totally R-rated version of this section as well, uh, for those of you who might be interested. But the short and G-rated version is that after researching and teaching using games and being a professor for about 15 years, all those experiments, projects, material work, they were exhausting, but not really the straw that broke the camel's back. It was mostly other work stuff, life stuff, but taken all together, it just became too much. I was completely, utterly burned out. G-rated version, it was bad. Mental health is super important, right? I told you that I, I'm deciding that you matter. Right, Mental health is super important. If you think you need help, talk to someone. If you're not sure you need help, you need help. You can talk to me, I'll listen, and I'll try to point you into some good people. Take your mental health and work-life balance seriously, please. You matter. So why did I burn out? Well, I was thinking that experiments and case studies get published, but they don't help teachers. Projects are great, but they're exhausting and not all that transformative. My teaching and research wasn't sustainable. I wasn't having the impact I wanted to have. I needed to figure out how to build an engine that ticked all the shipment 51 boxes. So I hit pause for about a year. I was working, but I, I and, and pauses are great. Like in a game, you have to pause to, to take a drink, to think about things. Take more pauses, please. And I just read like crazy. I read stuff like this. So these might actually solve the problems that you're trying to work on right now. I don't know. G has some wonderful YouTube keynotes. Dissertations, they're actually really good. I think the dissertations in G, like DGBLL are some of the best research out there. Um, it's a, I, uh, for me, it was a bad idea to go into teachers on Twitter. That was not a good experience and didn't help me that much. And media education was really good, but these, these might actually solve your problems. And then I finally hit upon a teaching and research framework, the pedagogy of multiliteracies that works, that worked, that works for me. And I'll talk about that next. So what matters for call for LLP? I really think it's taking time to figure out how to build our own little shipment 51 engines, to test them, to share them, to collaborate more. That's it. 
Uh, I'll tell you about my engine, and then we can talk more. So let's get back to cruising speed. So um, I took time through the pausing to create a really strong base. I, I took the time to try to think as long term as I could. Um, humans, I don't think, are good at thinking long term. Um, I wanted to connect the pros and reduce the cons of the stuff that I had done before. I started with some basic steps, and I wanted to connect traditional experiential and project work, but it really turned into so much more. I created a, this sort of theory, research, and practice engine that I can guard in. It took a long time to build. I made materials. I made mistakes. But I started small. I researched every little iteration. I kept trying it with more and more students and classes and contexts, and I kept researching and improving it. It's kind of like a sustainable permaculture for educational practice and research with games. It's my game, Terracoya. Um, it's based on the classical Terracoya, like that traditional literacy model in Japan. We use games, but we also use a lot of other media. And we added in more steps. And we do more than just reading, writing, and math. Right? Uh, the green, we experience things. Right? So we do game stuff. We conceptualize and we analyze. This is the traditional school stuff, right? discussion and research. And then we apply it. We participate in life activities, work, and volunteering. So we do all of these things, right? We just combine all of them, school, uh, game stuff, school stuff, and life stuff. My Game Terakoya students, they think about themselves. We play games that connect to their lives. You can see somebody playing Monopoly Junior. This is a university student who's really interested in what games children in America grow up playing. And so she played it really purposefully. We connect these experiences and ideas to big things in society. Students use their experiences and ideas to participate via projects that help them become the person they want to be. We use language in meaningful ways. I want students to be free, curious, critical, creative. Um, the method that I'll talk about next is really important. The materials, they're all available for free on my website and, and through LLP. The materials are mostly simple worksheets, simple experiences and projects. We talk about things that matter. I, as a teacher, do a lot of mediation. I can give you an example of these four steps. So um, this is a student uh, who, um, yeah, I, I just had lunch with her like 20 minutes ago. She, she stopped by just to see how I was doing. Um, uh, she played, we played some simple games. Um, we played tic-tac-toe in a simple board game. Based on that experience in our discussion, she became interested in this idea of the magic circle. Why, why does playing a game feel different than real life? Based on, after that, she got interested in how people write reviews. I mean, she, she used Amazon all the time, and she was interested in the language that people use, and she got interested in how people talk about games. So she analyzed those. She analyzed 35 different reviews, and then she wrote her own review, which included her work on the magic circle. So you can see just from experience to conceptualizing to analysis and to beautiful application and participation. Another example. Um, another student, we looked at the piano stairs. This is the fun theory project about changing behavior through fun, like the piano stairs get people to walk up the stairs and not use the escalator. We conceptualized what is fun, right? We defined it, we discussed it, we, we took it apart. She worked at a convenience store at the time and she got kind of worried, about, well not worried, she was concerned about everybody using plastic bags. And after doing all this work, she made this beautiful, simple print and play game that people can download from her website and print off at home that encourages families to take environmentally friendly action. She shared her work via a newspaper interview and, and put it up on the website, right? Experience, conceptualizing, analysis, and participation. Um, I just published a paper in Ludic Language Pedagogy on the pedagogy of multiliteracies as a really good way to teach language with games. There's a two page Oh, sorry, like a one page infographic. It's, it's just one page in there on what is it? Where do we do it? How does it work? Why do we do it? Um, and it's about all the things that we've been talking about. It's about it's about literacy, but it's about different realities and different modes. I'm just reading the bold, the, the bold language, right? Lots of different languages. Like Judith yesterday talked about multi multiliteracies. Yeah, we use first language, second language, um, different meta language to talk about uh, our experiences. Lots of different literacies, different texts, different technologies, health literacy, financial literacy, lots of different genres. We connect uh, who students are, who they are as students, uh, as, as, as sons, as daughters, as, as part-time job workers, as all sorts of things. And then really deep literacy of going from experiencing to conceptualizing, analyzing, and participating. So not just 
sage on the stage or guide on the side. It's really about connecting those two in really meaningful ways. So it's a nice little paper. Why do we do it? I, I you know, I, I'm interested in transformation, happiness, agency, freedom, learning new things, making a difference, participating, transfer, all these things. I'm important as a teacher. Students are important, and communities are important in this, and it works wonderfully. So that's on LLP. Um, if you're interested in sort of the theoretical underpinnings, I've got a talk on the LLP YouTube channel about the dialogic space, like why. The, the, the difference I wanted to make led me to choose the pedagogy, which created the need for dialogue, which created that sort of transformation and learning in students. Doing more with games means teaching differently, doing more, and researching differently, doing more. So again, that MMM that James and I wrote on, my PedML garden engine has a very solid method materials and mediation. Me method is a lesson plan, right? I use PedML, you might use TBLT, PPP, whatever it is. I have a lesson plan. I develop and I use materials to support that lesson plan. These are all freely available, um, always under revision. And mediation, like I needed to think really carefully about how I teach to get my students to do all the things I want them to do. Um, I, I had to articulate it for myself. Uh, in papers and for myself, I literally have a sort of like a mediation Bible about how to teach using this, this method. MMM, Method, Materials, and Mediation. It's a beautiful way to think about you know, making a difference. Um, students learn more from a combination of materials and mediation and games than from games alone. There's, there was a trend for a while uh, in, in DGBLL comparing games to games and materials, like a vocabulary worksheet why not add the teacher? Why not add the mediation, right? Games plus materials plus mediation, it does more. Also, um, I needed to slow down in order to have the chance to make and see some difference in my students. I realized that teaching is not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? And it's about enjoying the moments with my students. It's not a race. I needed to try activities again. At the same time, uh, James published this beautiful paper about the importance of slowing down in teaching, right? Do things again, take your time. You'll actually get to do more if you slow down more. Teaching differently, but also researching differently. Uh, yeah, I know this is messy, right? Um, researching a PetML method with games requires being creative and uh, creative and careful with the breadth of tools. There's more to researching games than just vocabulary tests and motiv motivation surveys. Um, we talked about this last night a little bit in the workshop. I use concept maps, right? Asking my students what they know before we play a game and what they know after we have all this uh, dialogue and mediation and project work, right? So concept maps can get at how students' knowledge develops in, this, in, my, in my teaching. I do textual analysis. I told you that my student looked at 35 texts. I used the different, I created a worksheet with criteria and then the student used that criteria to analyze her texts and then she produced the text. So then I can use the criteria to look at her work and her analysis, and I can trace development through all of those 36 texts, right? It's a different thermometer to stick in your research. Um, transcripts are wonderful, right? Re record sessions. Um, it lets you see micro de microgenetic development or what they, what they notice and pick up on. It'll help with your teaching. Evaluations are useful. Um, so I look at 21st century skills, participatory skills. I ask them to rate their skills, but also to give a reason because I'm interested in evidence, right? I'm not just interested in them telling me that they had a good time and learned something. I ask them to prove it, right? So what? Show me. I do the same thing with these reflections. These are the cover sheets um, to, uh, to that evidence, and they write their theses, uh, graduation theses, on their transformation. Of course, interviews are interesting because you can understand their experiences better and sort of triangulate those other uh, you know, instances of development. Tests, why not? Sure. Uh, pre and post TOEIC, pre and post vocabulary works as well. When you put together the method, the materials, the me mediation, and you have a lovely box of research thermometers, you can put together some really beautiful evidence of how teaching makes all the difference in the world for what can be done with games. And it lets you trace learning and transformation long-term. If there's time, I can go into data more deeply, if it matters, 
right? This is from that 2019 paper, which is on my website. I really think that the game Terakoya, um, it's based on the pedagogy of multiliteracies. I, I've, I'm writing lots of papers and I keep sharing things in the LLP Discord. It's really radically different than DGBLL in terms of teaching, research, practice, data, school, society. It really ticks all of the shipment 51 boxes for me. Sustainable, absolutely, right? Um, it's got students inspiring next generations of students. Like they show their project work, they show the, their, their, their analytical work and it inspires the next generation and they do even better work, right? And there's this beautiful theory research practice um, model baked in. Um, hype cycles, not at all, right? I'm using games in teaching, but I'm not really focused on the games themselves. I'm carefully putting them together with teaching to get results. I've got that critical distance. Games have absolutely changed the way that I teach because I'm using, they, they led me to think about uh, including more traditional ways and also more progressive ways, right? So I believe I'm integrating the technology with the teaching. Praxis, for sure. Theory informs practice and I share things via research, which creates that loop. Mediation, we talk as much as possible about things that really matter. If there's time, I can share some positive and negative outcomes of using mediation. It doesn't always work, and I'm, that's something that I'm researching. Empty babble? Nope. Uh, it's purposeful. Even our chatting, which I don't really care for all the time, is about being human, right? I ask my students, are you happy today? Are you doing OK? And then I try to do something about it, because it it's all connects to the education as well. right? I don't want to divorce their self-happiness with their education anymore. Normalization, games are important, like a pencil is important, but it's the thinking and doing around and with games that is our focus, and students know this. Transformation, absolutely. It's all about taking stock of who students are, who they want to be, and then me and them working towards that. We're absolutely doing this. Right. This is from my from the date game to It's a simple sheet. I've got a longer sheet I can share with you later. Right. Who are you? Who do you want to be? This is what we're going to do to get to get you there. Students often surpass right who they wanted to be. They find themselves going in new, bigger, longer directions. Right. Again, um, these are sort of their their reflections of what they've done. Right. Who 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 I was. Who I am now. Right. You can see happiness and confidence and things on there, right? At the beginning, right, top left, I'm not good at anything, but then through all the experiencing, conceptualizing, analyzing, participation, right? Right, um, she, right? She, she got happier and healthier. And you can see that English, right, fell out of her hands. She became less interested in English and became interested in other things and got better at other things. But still, she was able to reflect in this beautiful way. Literacy, absolutely. Students are playing, understanding, and making things in and for society. Um, they're developing other literacies too, like technology literacy, health literacy. And I'm expanding my teaching literacies as well, right? Uh, mediation, discourse analysis, things like that. Impact, students are determining their own futures and transformations. They're doing things, they're practicing being free. That's impactful, I think. It's amazing. It's so different than the other stuff and the earlier work I talked about. Teaching, like I enjoy teaching more than I ever had because I can see students transform and I can see the effect that our interactions have on their learning and themselves. Again, check out the Human Restoration Project. Research, I'll have, I have more data than I'll ever be able to use. That's a good thing. On literacy, articulation, social cultural theory, participation gap, roles, mediation, it's wonderful. I'm happier and healthier than I've ever been, partly because of the research into practice stuff, but also seeing my students happier and also the sustainability and impact of it. I really think that you making an engine that you can garden will make you happier and healthier as well. I think PetML is one, one lovely way out of the pit of DGBLL. It could be PetML, but it could be something else. It really depends on your context, what methods you're familiar with, and your research tools. Ultimately, I think different contexts, students, teachers, preferences, abilities, and other constraints will require different games and different pedagogical implementations. We're getting to the end of the talk, and I'll shift gears again. We're almost done. I'll just read this text from Nir Automata. I think it totally applies to what's going on at this conference and in the field. Give up here? 
Do you accept defeat? Is it all pointless? Do you think games are silly little things? Do you admit there is no meaning to this world? I bet you're having a tough time right now. One thing is certain, you've got us with you. Rescue offer received from dot, dot, dot. Do you accept the offer, yes or no? Ped, sorry, PedML is a gold mine. There's so much in all of the aspects or even one thing. If you just looked at the where or the how or the why, we could research PedML for the rest of our careers. I can, you could research, teach and design things for decades. And I think you should. We all know the problems with schools and academic fields. Mattering, call DGBLL, it's rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. PedML is flexible, inclusive, transformative, practical. It offers an endless teaching, research and social impact space. I think now is a wonderful chance for you, for us, to make a really important turn. This is the part of near automata when many players come together to accomplish something truly amazing. I think that we could do the same for teaching and researching with games. All right, so I have a PedML ped research agenda, you could too. If you want to make a difference right, in your teaching, research, lives, contact me. If you wanna to work together or you'd like to try it, I will help you. If you're interested, hit me up through email or the Discord. I will help you, right? Let me and other people help you. Those 10 steps, right? I, I'll, I'll do my best to, 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 to share what I've done and help you out. For you to reflect on your freedom to play, read some things, plan some things, run your project, write it up, share it, continue your agenda, and then helping you help others and continuing to make me obsolete. This matters. You matter. I know that I covered a lot in this talk. I just wanted to dump as much out there and see what comes back. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. And honestly, I don't see it getting better anytime soon unless we, unless we choose to make it better. So I'm gonna wrap up quickly. The discussions actually need to start. I don't think that we've actually even started talking about games yet. I think they need to start and the conferences need to continue. Um, emails, Discord, face-to-face, -face, other conferences, the conversations need to start and continue. This talk was all about mattering. I think that we're at a really important moment in history. The world is dangerously close to absolutely nothing mattering. But I hope that we can still choose to make some things matter. Do games matter? I'm not gonna hype games. I'm not gonna compare games with other media. It's all about integrating games with education's why, who, what, you, goals, time, contexts. But yeah, games matter. They're one of the highest forms of being human, making, playing. We are homo ludens. Games encapsulate amazing creativity, technology, ideology, and communication. But no, games don't matter. The teaching around a game matters a lot more. But yeah, uh, teaching matters more, but games still matter. These experiences and ideas and systems and media can be a great springboard or visualization or an experience that kickstarts some amazing teaching and learning. I just want you to think about what mattering we could engineer with great games and great teaching if we think about the goals first. Does teaching matter? Absolutely. I think it's unethical and pathetic that we've been putting so much time and energy into technology instead of teaching. Great teaching can make all the difference in the world. Even if you're designing an educational game that's never used in a classroom, only by students at home or you dump something on the iOS store, your design work is teaching and you should care about being a better and effective teacher. Stop ignoring pedagogy. It's time to double down, triple down on pedagogy. It's a career maker, not only for your students, but for your CV and the field. Please think more about teaching. Aim high, uh, sustainability, impact, and your own shipment criteria, but start small. Try something, reflect, revise, repeat, share and support. Teaching is super hard work. Many hands make light, fun, rad work. This motivated me for many years. As did this. Does research matter? Does research that doesn't connect to teaching and students and society matter? No, probably not. But we do have a chance to make a change to focus on things that matter. And you don't have to do it all by yourself. Stand on the shoulders of giants. 
read the stuff that I've got on my website. There are lots of great ideas there. Try partnering with other people and solving collective problems that matter to them. Be curious. If that's any good start to doing good research, think broadly, think deeply. Ask, so what? Who cares? Does this even matter? Learn how to do different types of research and use different tools to measure different things that could matter more. Let's group up. Let's continue the discussion on the LLP Discord. All of the stuff that I've talked about today can continue to be discussed on Discord. Let's do some small, meaningful, praxis-driven work. You can get CV points by publishing teacher-focused articles in ludic language pedagogy. We can decide that everything matters. We can decide that nothing matters, or we can and sh should choose to make something matter. Other people can help you play the academic games or life game you want to play. You can help other people play better academic games and life games too. Let's move from potential, DGPLL, to practice, ludic language pedagogy. Let's work on things that really matter. Let's matter together. You can get lots of stuff on my website. I welcome your playful questions or comments now or at any time. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me? I can. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, absolutely incredible uh, presentation, Jonathan. Uh, don't know where to start. G great. Yeah, I, I'm, re <laughs> I'm, re I'm relieved. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that was my first. That was my first question, right? I didn't. I didn't swear, did I? No. No. I don't, I don't think I did, right? You could have done though. It was. It was passionate. Uh -huh, a lot. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. I. I, I uh, there's a, there's an R-rated version of this talk that I'd be happy to give over gin and tonics. I invite the audience to ask questions by raising a hand. Uh, please feel free to turn your mic and um, camera on. I also have an idea for the question and answer session if we've got a little bit of time, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, it's that OPR thing, James, but we can talk about that later. Yep. I feel bad that games are a backdrop. I wanted to put like a custom backdrop of clouds, but I feel bad that <laughs> I feel really hypocritical. If your first okay, question is why are you such a hypocrite, I, I appreciate that. Let me let me ask a question straight off. So I think this is perhaps uh, quite pertinent. If teachers and researchers here uh, are interested in doing something with games and PedML, what can should they do today? What's the first step? So I think the first thing that you could do is well talk to me, I'd be happy to help you, right? That's the first thing. Like, please don't run into all those pitfalls and walls that I did. Like, it's taken me six years to build this stuff, just the PetML stuff. And I have a one page worksheet. It's in the, it's in the, um, it's in that one page infographic paper that I shared. The 2002 a, it, one, right? Yeah. Like, it, there's, a, there's a one page worksheet of experience, discussion, analysis, and application. It's a one page worksheet. You could just use a tweet, right, James, the, the Konami thing. Like, it's a one page worksheet. Take one student and go through it. That's, so that's something that you can do like today with your daughter, with your son, with yourself to get your feet wet on a different pedagogical move, right? Maybe you, maybe you haven't played that many games. Play a game and, 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 and re react to it, right? Was this interesting? Was it? Uh, yeah, there's a link. It's all on my website. Um, there's a million things on my website. I'll clean it up. Um, Okay, uh, questions. Can someone paste the worksheet again? No, uh, we'll get that later. Uh, yeah. Someone has a hand up. Alex. Alex, hey, our, Alex. Our, our friend hey. from down in Australia. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Thank you very much Hello. for your presentation. Thanks for coming. You're, you've raised um, many, many um, ideas and, and issues related with digital game-based learning. My, I want to just focus for a second on, on some of the points you ran, made around teaching and pedagogy. And it's an area where I think researchers in the field have perhaps let teachers down. Um, I'm just coming off a couple of systematic reviews and I must have read hundreds and hundreds of papers that used digital games in you know, classroom, secondary school contexts. And the detail about what they did is almost non-existent. That's right. It's, it's so difficult to discern the, the nuances, you know, 15 minutes of this, then 10 minutes of playing the game, and then this activity, like, it's so difficult. And it makes me wonder, you know, in any other field, if you didn't, in engineering or medicine, if you didn't outline in your paper what you did, you wouldn't get through the first step. Right. So I guess my question is, 
why do you think there's such a reticence on the part of researchers to, to, to detail what it is they're doing from a pedagogical sense with the games in their studies? Um, so yeah, James talked. James and I talked about this a little bit last night in the in the research uh, workshop. We referenced Kurt Squire's book, which is a beautiful read, like a really high definition read on um, using uh, civilization and other games to teach history. And he he show, he's got a book, so he does that. At, in in the coda, in at the end of the book, he talks about the science fetish, right? He talks about education having this sort of inferiority complex. And and wanting to you know stand next to the big boys of science, right? There's the humanities and there's there's this, the sciences. In the sciences, you don't have to do that, right? You don't have to detail all this. You don't have to talk about yourself as a researcher. You're you're you're, you're it's, it's written in the passive, right? The 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 vial was emptied, not I emptied the vial, right? And so he talks about this science fetish that educational researchers have in wanting to live up to the science standard, and how in order to get anything done, we do need to move to that, like treating each other as humans, right? I wanna do this, you are this student, let's work together to co-create a pedagogical intervention. I think that's the only thing we're gonna be able to do, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to try to make that, uh, to try to move that forward. Journals aren't going to change. We either have to start our own indie journals as, as James and I have done, or you have to create better support groups you're not going to change it. It's the Titanic. It's rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Just get off while you can, right? The robots are leaving. <laughs> maybe, there, and, maybe there are no robots. <laughs> One more question on the pedagogies while, um, while I've got you. How much do you think the, you know, the teaching strategies that teachers bring to the digital games classroom oh my God. Need, need to build on or, or, or will come from, is it enough for them to build on the strategies and understandings they already have about their particular learning areas? Or do you think we need a more nuanced, you know, digital game focused set of, of um, pedagogies? I, okay, so one of my favorite quotes, I mean, James knows this, right? Is that there's nothing new, only truth. It's one of my favorite quotes from G. I don't think G said it before, but like the answers are out there. Um, and what I want, I'm specifically referring to is just the, the stuff about literacy. like. We have enough, I think, pedagogical advice in the literacy work out there that applies to digital games as well, right? Teach, like, so, so experience something and then unpack it, describe it, analyze it, make judgments, right? It's almost like art critique. Did you like the movie? Ah, the acting was good. What was good about the acting? You can do the same with games. Like, I think games are just like playing catch up to lit critique, we have the tools out there, absolutely. One of the hardest things I had to do when, when making PetML was digging through all those books and 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 putting them in a package that I understood because I'm stupid. But actually, that, I, I didn't understand those things. They're written for academics. I, I wasn't trained in literacy teaching. I had to translate them into into my own context and with for my students, for them to understand, right? So I don't think... We, well, we simultaneously need a new pedagogy, but we can also use the tools that are out there. And does that, that's what I, that's how I feel. Like they're, they're out there. They're, 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 that, that David Buckingham book is 20 years old, that beautiful media education book. That's the, one of the backbones of the stuff that I'm doing. And every time I pull out a question from that book in a class, I just get amazing results from students, right? Who benefits from this piece of media, right? Um, Great, I'll shout out the Colossus, right? So who benefits from this? Where did this come from? Who made it? What was the production cycle? What's the language? What message are they trying to say? Who are, who's, who's the intended audience? You know, we've got it. We've got it, we just have to do it. And I, I'd love to help people actually do it. Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up very soon here. Uh, do you, so... can, I, can I make a pitch for the OPR? Uh, after Gary has asked his question. Okay, cool. Go for it, Gary. Uh, that thank last you, question, Jonathan. by uh, the way. Th sorry, sorry, Gary. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jonathan. That was that was inspiring. Um, let's um, do it. I'm wondering, maybe. No, yeah, just leave it I in mean, potential. His, his, Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, <laughs> I, mean, here's my, I mean, it's kind of a simple question. Um, do you just think the classroom is simply too complicated to research effectively? I mean, people are researching no. what they can rather than what is actually real. What's your feeling? Um, maybe the research things that are published are, we can observe improvements personally, but then 
actually, as you, I mean, as you saw, as you were showing really amazing things that your students were producing, uh -huh. is that, and you can observe that, but then can you publish it? Um, how would you, what okay. do you feel? That's, that was part um, of the burnout too. So the, the paper that I shared today, the 2019, my first game, Terakoya, this is a different talk, right? We can talk about that, James. Like I wrote that paper, it was rejected by every single top tier journal, okay? Like I went through uh, LLT, FLA, every top tier journal desk rejected it. They looked at the paper and said, we can't publish this. I, did, I didn't hype games. I didn't, I didn't hype vocabulary. It was something I wanted to do. It got rejected from everything, which led to our, our, the creation of LLP. We had, to, we had to build the playgrounds we wanted to play in. So no, like screw them. <laughs> there, okay, there's so basically a, that's you're, you're, the, the system is flawed, but you think it can be rebuilt. Let's, I don't in, think it can be rebuilt. That, that I think really we just do something else. So yeah, yeah, James right. desk, the only paper okay. that's ever been desk rejected in LLP is one that Je James desk rejected from me about my solution to the system, right, James? <laughs> yeah, it's not a nice one. <laughs> It's, it's not a nice one at all. No, that's that's a stretch goal for our Kickstarter. Um, right. Jonathan, I gotta wrap a... you up. Uh... Okay, okay. So my suggestion, no, no. So I, honestly, Gary, we can rebuild it. We can we can do something else. Let's let's go play somewhere else. So one one way to continue the discussion, which I really do want to have, I'm inviting you to play. Co-author my keynote paper with me. LLP wow. encourages playful submissions. Whatever you want, we can do zines and interviews and all this kind of stuff. We have open peer review meaning we talk to each other. It's not blind. This is not a bad thing. We talk to each other right. about research openly. If you join Discord, uh, you, you comment on my paper, we discuss it, revise it. Number four, we all become co-authors and everyone levels up. I'm serious, right? If this is the thing that gets the conversation going, Gary, about research about, or, and um, Alex about pedagogy, okay, in one week, I will, I will write something on our Discord about co-authoring my keynote paper with me. And we'll turn it into something that can hopefully make a difference. So if you if you if you've never published a paper before, if you want to talk about this kind of stuff, join Discord, comment on my paper. Let's all do something together. I'm sick of potential. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, I excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah. I don't know what to say now. Um, I'm just going to just move into uh, just a reminders about what's coming up later today. We have the roundtable at. Um, 5.15, the AGM meeting at 6.30, and the social event starts at 7 p.m. Oh, 5.45 for the round table. Yeah, um, and, and that's gonna be, and hopefully, Jonathan, will you be around for the, for the round table at 5.45? Mm -hmm. There's a round table discussion on topics like what is gamification? How do we, uh, yeah, and bloody, bloody, bloody. Possibly. Yeah, uh, my, my son is giving a presentation here tomorrow. I've got to do a dry run with him, so. Okay. Uh, I'd like to call everyone just to thank Jonathan one more time for his uh, incredible presentation. And uh, I hope Please we can keep, reach keep out. The, yeah, keep yeah. the conversation going. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Please, yeah, thank you very much. Please just reach out to me. I'm happy to keep chatting any way possible. Thank you.